Hello and welcome to episode number seven of the Abundant Living Ecuador podcast. I am Jesse Bayer here with Darnell Dunn. We're the co-founders and managing partners of Abundant Living Ecuador. And we're going to jump around a little bit for you today, cover a number of topics uh, related to investing in Ecuador and life here. We've, uh, we're in this beautiful stretch of weather here in Loja. Um, I don't know, what has it been? A month now, maybe? Yeah, coming up on a month, maybe three weeks, three and a half weeks, so yeah. Which is not, not so uncommon for this kind time of year. We get, uh, we're certainly in my favorite time of year in Loja, which is basically winter back home. Kind of, uh, the, the weather in Loja is, it, it varies over the course of the year. Um, it goes from unbearable <laughs> for, for me, although a lot of people enjoy it, but yeah. unbearable. We had some people in town yesterday who came to see a property who, you know, the, your, the your idea of terrible weather would be their idea of ideal weather yeah. year round. Yeah, cloudy, sort of overcast in the mid sixties to low seventies. Yeah, so that's what you get from basically like April or May. You know, obviously it's not exact. Some somewhere around April or May, rains more and gets colder. It can even be in the fifties during those months. Um, sometimes during the day, but more often the sixties. And then that that goes through until somewhere around September. And then the rest of the year, so basically around September through around April, May, is 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 really nice. I mean, even for me who likes hot, like I would prefer, like I like 90 degrees. I know I'm, I'm a little weird. Um, even for me, that time of year is great. It's, it's mo- usually sunny, not always sunny, but usually if it rains, it rains, you know, a couple of days a week, not every day. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's great weather for, for those, you know, seven, eight months, whatever, whatever it is. Something else that's nice. I think it's worth mentioning for our listeners this time of year is just how the holiday season here just starts so much earlier. You know? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. You know, I walked into my building the other day and it's decorated for Christmas already. Right. And that was, you know, when I got home from last week's podcast, it was ready. <laughs> yeah, <I> mean, <laughs> so you're talking about... You know, the last week of October, you've got Christmas decorations. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you have a four-day weekend last weekend for the Day of the Dead in, in Cuenca Independence Day. Basically Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a – in a four-day weekend, you might as well not have the week because you've got – you know, you get to work on Wednesday. You know, we started working on Wednesday. Today's Friday. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of holidays in Ecuador. I think you were telling me, and I, I don't know if we'll remember the specifics, but you were telling me you had come across something that showed that Ecuador had one of the uh, lowest average hour work weeks in the world. The lowest. Oh, the lowest. <laughs> <laughs> the lowest by like three hours or something like oh that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Beat France, huh? Wow. Impressive. Yeah. No, I mean, these guys make French people look like workaholics. <laughs> I mean, Chris, and I know plenty of French people, and they're related to plenty. And yeah, I mean, the French people would be like, "This is too much." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a little, tremendous amount of holidays, and yeah, Christmas is like a month long deal. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, you know, you've got maybe six or eight parties you've got to go to if you're from here and and have lived here your whole life. At least four, because yeah. if you're married, you have a dinner for both sides of each family. Then you have your dinner with your college friends. Then you have your dinner with your high school friends. Like those are like everybody does that. Kind of jumps in, and I don't want to get too far into this yeah. because it's maybe not that interesting, <laughs> but it kind of jumps into group dynamics there as well. It's like people run in packs here. It's like people who are friends in high school or even middle school or whatever it is, like that's a group that stays intact right. like basically forever. And they do everything together. There's very few things that they don't do without each other. That's a funny thing, too. It's like people don't – you can't go – I mean, you can. I do. You do. But, I mean, you can't – no Ecuadorian would go to a bar alone here ever. Like you go to a bar at minimum with a friend and more often in a group. Yeah. But like go to a bar, strike up a conversation, watch the game does not exist. No, because everybody else is in a group. So you can't 
you can't like break into a group. Right. It just doesn't work like that. There's also there's also I mean, funny enough from that perspective, there's that's you know, there's no such thing as picking up women that way either. Like women neither women or men go to a bar to meet other women or men. The way that that would happen is like a guy would be like, hey, I'm interested in your friend such and so, and then they would all get invited out together as a group, go as a group, and then the guy would like, you know, try to talk to the girl or whatever. Yeah, the friends would like put them together, put them together. and then <laughs> that's how that would work. Yeah. Very so, interesting. Very, yeah, totally different, totally different, those kinds of things. So anyways, getting into uh, perhaps more intellectually stimulating <laughs> topics. Um, let's see, where do we want to start? You know, it's funny, I was... I was um, talking to you darnell the other day and we were chatting about i don't even remember what we were showing some properties and chatting about a house and there's a house that we have listed right now on the website and it just struck me a couple of things about it um the house is listed for two hundred nine thousand. it's in one of the nicest neighborhoods in loja it's the house is in really good shape it's it's fully furnished being and being sold that way it has six bedrooms and seven bathrooms so i mean it's just a gigantic house balcony you know the whole nine it's it's really sweet and it and you know i've been here a while i've kind of grown accustomed to prices but it just struck me the other day you know i i I moved here from brooklyn i was living at the time and it just struck me the difference you know what would i get in brooklyn for my two hundred nine thousand? and of course two hundred nine thousand is your asking price so that wouldn't you know wouldn't be the sale price it'd be lower than that um, but you know, what would I get for my 209,000 in Brooklyn? And I was thinking back on it. I mean, when I was leaving Brooklyn, you know, just in, in an, in kind of a decent neighborhood, not, not at all a high end neighborhood. I mean, not even close to a high end neighborhood. Uh, you know, apartments, apartments were selling for like, like if somebody took a brownstone and divided it up into three or four apartments, those apartments were selling for half a million dollars and up. Um, you know, uh, you get a cheaper one, really cheap one, like maybe a studio for, you know, less than that, but, um, you know, just tremendous difference. And I was just thinking, you know, just if you've got uh, a little bit of capital or, or you're sitting on a house that you can sell back home and you've got a way to have a little bit of income here in Ecuador, whether it's some sort of business that doesn't, uh, require you to be there elsewhere or, or you want to open some sort of business or entrepreneurial, you know, deal here in Ecuador. I mean, it's just amazing the bang for your buck in, in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that carries in all your other costs of living, of course, as well. And I won't go too into that, deep into that. We've talked about it before, but it just struck me the other day, like, wow, $209,000. I can get a beautiful house in a beautiful neighborhood that is gigantic. Like if I had aunts and uncles and cousins, they could come and live there with me. Right. The other thing um, that came up in a conversation I had with some clients who came into town and were interested in some properties, they had come to Loja after being on the coast in Manta. No, we don't have any properties there currently, um, but I think it's interesting just for people to know that that same concept extends to other places in Ecuador if the mountains aren't your thing. Um, there's plenty of places on the coast where you can get you know, beachfront properties, beachfront condos in that same price range. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, talking about real estate, there's an interesting phenomenon here about uh, prices. So, you know, you don't have comparables per se, comps, you know, you don't have comparables per se in Ecuador. So normally if you're back home, you know, if you're in the States or Europe or Canada or wherever, you're, you're, you're thinking about putting a home on your, on, on the market and you're looking, you know, what, at what price should I list it at? You've got comps to compare it to. So your, you know, your local real estate agent or whoever you're looking with or whoever you're working with will say, you know, Hey, let's market it at this price. And the reason he's saying that is because he's done his research. He's checked recent sales in that area, similar. And, you know, he's got an idea of the market. There's just no comps here. There's no, nobody tracks that data and, you know, we're starting to ourselves so that we can, you know, have comps in the future, but nobody tracks that data. So when you're, when you're, when a, when a home when an owner is looking to put a property on the market, he doesn't have a way to really know what he wants for it. And so a lot of times people just make up numbers. Um, you know, you've got like, maybe you'll have a situation where in 2012, some lot, some, you know, thousand square meter lot in Vilcabamba sold for, you know, some very high price. Maybe it had, you know, it had a river and fruit trees and it had views and it was small and somebody just really wanted it and the market was different. And so it sold for like a lot. And then what other people have done is they've taken the price per square meter of that 
and they extrapolate that out to their property. And they say, well, I've got 30 hectares and at this price per square meter, it's worth $5 million. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but <laughs> right. But you have like, you have these kind of just kind of outrageous prices that people throw out there. But that really kind of brings you to the difference between asking price and sales price here, because that's also very different. You know, back home, you're going to be within, you know, five to 20, I think at the outside, whatever, something like that of, of your asking price, obviously, depending on the market and if it's, you know, a buyer's market or seller's market and so forth. But you're going to be relatively close to the asking price and the sales price, unless you're just asking an outrageous number. Here, that's not always the case. You know, you have situations where a guy says, well, I want 700,000 and maybe a whole lot of thinking hasn't gone into that. And when, you know, three or 400,000 is on the table cash, you know, that ends up being the sale price. I think uh, another factor to take into account there is where the property is located. Obviously, location comes into play in real estate, no matter where you're talking about in the world. But you tend to see asking prices closer to sale prices in the city where there tends to be more transactions going on. Whereas in the rural areas, you know, that could be a mixed bag. Um, you could certainly, you can certainly, in our case, you know, we paid fairly close to the asking price. That was probably more of a special case, I would say, generally speaking, with larger pieces of property where there's going to be a large investment going into infrastructure, bringing water, bringing electricity, building roads, those kinds of things, where the person who might be selling the property has inherited the property, really doesn't have a vision for it. Those properties tend to be... Um, you tend to see a, a bigger spread between what the asking price is and what it would eventually sell for, or what the person's willing to let it let go, let the property go for. Another thing along those lines is how much the person needs the money, because you might get into a situation where the person just really needs the cash, and you could get a really, really good deal. Um, and get a price that really had nothing to do with the value of the land just because the person needed it. Yeah, and that brings us into the type of type of sellers that there are, which there's really different types of sellers. But just jumping back to your point, yeah, that's a great point. I, I'm not referring to the city. The city is, is much closer to the way the market would function in the States or, or elsewhere. This is only for large pieces of land and absolutely not true across the board. So there are plenty of people who have it priced you know, at or very close to what it's it's worth. In fact, there's even some some people in some of the older generations have numbers in their head about what they want that I would say are too low. Even so, you you run into that as well. But there's certainly some amount of people, uh, a, a large enough amount that it's it's you'll you'll come across it a lot uh, in the in the boat of of type of property I was talking about. But yeah, and so types of sellers, um, it's. Also very different than back home. Generally back home, you've got, you know, two, maybe three types of sellers. It would be like, you know, just people who have it on the market for whatever reason. They're moving or they're downsizing or they're, you know, whatever whatever their reason is. Or you've got people who are in debt, you know, have issues with, you know, a mortgage gone bad or whatever. And that's kind of your two types of sellers back home where obviously there's a few others with bank-owned properties and whatever. But in terms mm -hmm. of your central, well, here it's very different. Um, here you've got a few types of sellers and their ways of going about the processes are very different. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people will put their home on the market, quote, on the market, but they don't really care if they sell it. Um, right. Like they just have a big piece of land. They're like, yeah, if someone comes along and gives me this price, you know, I'll sell it. Yeah. And I think that those, those kinds of sellers, I think, are much more prominent here because it's mostly a cash market. And so if somebody doesn't have a necessity to sell and it's just kind of a nice to have as opposed to a need, then, you know, those people are much less flexible and are looking for, um, you know, those prices that you probably don't want to pay. Yeah, speaking. exactly. They're, they're often the people who will give you, throw out those numbers at you that just don't make any sense. Right. Um, and happy to sit on it. Yeah, they don't really care. And often the way that that plays out, like on the ground is, it's like a family, often the older generation, and it's like, yeah, if they sold their big, you know, big piece of land, they'd move to the Loja and live in an apartment or live in a house. Often they might even have a house already in Loja or an apartment, 
And so it's like, yeah, if they can sell it, then, you know, they'll head to the city and, you know, grow old there as opposed to on the land. And if not, then they'll just stay on the land and, you know, their kids will keep it if, if they pass it along. And that's kind of usually how that goes. Um, you've got a lot of siblings that own land together. The way that the Ecuadorian law is surrounding, um, surrounding inheritance is different. So if... I pass away and I have three kids and I can't say like, okay, Johnny owns the land and the other two don't. All three are going to have a stake in the land. So you've got a lot of sibling owned properties. And for whatever reasons, it, it appears that the, that second generation, that generation that are now between say 25 or 30 and, you know, 50, or 60, whatever it is, they're just not as interested in living out in the country. They're more interested in being in the city. So most of them for a variety of reasons, that being one, another being they'd like the money and they'd like to be able to split it up amongst themselves, have properties on the market. Right. And those are the situations that really get the most messy yes. because you have to have everybody on board before that property can be sold. Or you need to have an agreement in place about how the property is going to be subdivided before moving forward. And, you know, off of that, you've got a lot of people who are in their 70s and 80s looking to sell properties because they'd like to avoid those situations and avoid some of the rules surrounding inheritance, sell the property and give their kids the money as opposed to the property. Right. While they're still alive. While they're still Because that works a lot easier. Right. And Once a person dies, I mean, that's just a, it's, it's a headache. A quick caveat on that. It's really a very sad thing because the, the Ecuadorian government has structured the inheritance rules in such a way that it puts pressure on families to sell their family property before the pay, before the current owners, you know, who would be the grandparents, uh, pass away, and you know, you've you've got tons and tons of properties on the market right now that have you know have been in the family hundreds of years and are now being sold as a result of the pressures that they're feeling from the the structure of the law here. Right. Um, and then I guess the last group would be people who have. Uh, taken on loans they can't repay, um, which is also a significant group. And I think that... A growing that, number. Growing number. Yeah, especially, I mean, I think we jumped in and we talked a little bit about this last week and we'll actually get into it this week as well. But credit is being tightened here in Ecuador. So a lot of people have taken out loans for all sorts of reasons. Credit is a relatively new phenomenon in Ecuador. Interest rates are very high. Um, people don't always think through things in terms of those those ways the same that they would back home, although certainly plenty of people get into trouble back home with that as well. And, you know, you've got a lot, a lot of, it's also very difficult to get a loan here. So you've got a lot of homeowners who have leveraged their property for whatever they were trying to do, and they're now having trouble repaying it and therefore are looking to sell their property before the, before the bank takes it from them. So that's obviously a motivated group. Obviously, you can get good prices from those sellers, and it's not necessarily a small group either, although it's, a little trickier than back home figuring out who they are. Right. You know, going back to to um, that pressure that, that the uh, inheritance system puts on families, I think that's one of the major reasons you saw so much blowback from the tax proposals about changing the inheritance tax. Um, and now... And this kind of ties into an article I wanted to get into that I came across last week uh, that talks about Ecuador introducing a bill to limit the limit tax evasion when it comes to the inheritance tax, quote unquote tax evasion. Good, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm <laughs> glad you caught that this time. <laughs> and uh, I'll, it's a short article, so I'll read it quickly. The president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, has proposed measures to combat the evasion of tax on inheritance, legacies, and donations. The proposal, which would be contained in a bill submitted to the National Assembly on October 23, 2015, targets transfers to foreign or domestic trusts, use of flux agreements, and structures that use companies in low tax jurisdictions. A government spokesman said at a press conference that the bill does not include any changes to the tax burden. Due to widespread protest earlier this year, the government was forced to, quote unquote, temporarily withdraw plans to increase the taxation of large inheritances and lower the minimum thresholds for calculating the tax. So essentially, this is kind of a way for the administration to save some face by taking off these 
taking these proposals off the table, but in the meantime, implementing something along the lines of FACTA in the United States, where they would be allowed to essentially keep track of all your accounts, even if they're outside of Ecuador, and tax you on income outside of Ecuador just because you're Ecuadorian. So a citizen, a citizenship-based tax regime. Yeah, and more so for, it's not, I don't know that it's necess- as much, yeah, yeah, income to some degree, but it really screws you when you die as okay. well. They're like, you know, it's so that you can't have holdings that are not, that the Ecuadorian government can't tax, you know, when you're trying to pass them on or change the ownership structure. So it's like, it's almost like a fat, a FATCA for, you know, death yeah, right. <laughs> kind of thing, um, which is, yeah, it's, it's, um, disheartening. <laughs> yeah, and it's very interesting because I saw a debate um, that took place with the president who was an economist, quote unquote economist, and uh, in some of his, you know, some other Ecuador, prominent Ecuadorian economists who were talking, and they really tried to frame it as a socialism versus neo, ne- neoliberalism framework, which is just very silly, in my opinion, anyway, in general, uh, as a premise. Yes. But um, what was interesting about it is he, they were portraying that as, and where am I going with this? Hold on. It, they were essentially trying to say that, you know, people who want to pass on what they've earned to the next generation without then paying taxes again on that were somehow morally corrupt. And he was trying to compare it to the law in the United States. I mean, the law in the United States for the inheritance tax, the threshold is $5 million. So it's hard to compare that to people here where under their proposal, they were going to lower the threshold to $35,000. (laughs) <laughs> claiming all those, that all those rich people right, <laughs> claiming that that somehow you know that would only affect rich people because the threshold now is 70,000 and only 3% of people pay that tax but if you cut it in half doesn't that stand to reason that that percentage would grow significantly i mean the the poorest person in ecuador ha- has a has an inheritance of close to $35,000 it's if you own land in some faraway place that's a really large, really large piece of land, and you know you live out there and you farm the land and you live on the land. I mean, that's an asset that'll probably cost more than thirty five thousand dollars if it's split between more than two or three people. And so it, it's just a little disingenuous and left a, a real sour taste in my mouth. Government being disingenuous? Come on, <laughs> come on, that's impossible. Yeah, I mean, they, Correa, it was, I mean, well, look, thank God, you know, that tax proposal is off the table. That seems to be widely confirmed at this point. So they've shelved the inheritance tax. They've shelved the uh, capital, the new ta- capital gains tax for real estate. Um, and yes, they've replaced it, as Darnell said, with uh, an, a proposal to vigorously enforce uh, <laughs> existing existing law, uh, and I guess perhaps some, some tweaks to the existing law as well, uh, to make it very difficult to structure your assets in a way that allows you to not be subject to the, you know, what's already on the books. Um, so, yeah, it's funny, I was... Although it, anybody who's writing those laws is exempt from it anyway. <laughs> right. But, Just know, felt that... But that we don't tell anybody that. Mentioning... <laughs> Yeah, there was. Um, I, w- I was reading an article actually that you had sent me, Darnell. Um, so yeah, th- there was a funny, funny uh, quote here. Let me find it. So they were talking about uh, these new proposals that Darnell was just outlining, and the vice president of the Assembly's Economic Systems Commission. You have to have really long names when you're involved in, you know, stealing money from people and regulating. Uh, you know, people's behavior. And but, I mean, that's even long in English. Imagine how long that would be in Spanish. <laughs> right, you'd have a <laughs> That'd few. Be at least five more words. <laughs> so the Vice President of the Assembly's Economic Systems Commission, Galo Borja, says the, that currently shifting money offshore is not illegal. It's just unjust. The legislation will make it illegal. So good to know that we have more things being illegal because that's always good. Well, it's just about making the world a more just place. <laughs> 
right? And then uh, don't worry. I mean, the proposal won't affect him anyway. He he can still continue to structure his money in a way so that he won't have to report the taxes. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the article goes on to say the proposed law would tax capital gains from legacies, donations, and other transfers, regardless of the place of death, nationality, domicile, or residence of the de- deceased or his or her, her heirs. So, you know, doesn't it's it's an improvement from what was on the table before, but it's certainly a loss of liberty as well. Right. And the other thing about that too is the the US or the Ecuador is not the US. Uh I mean that's one thing to say that and put that in writing. It's a whole another thing altogether to enforce it. And Definitely. um that that I think will be interesting to to keep an eye on in the in the near future to see how that if it does end up passing uh, how that's implemented. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, enforcement versus the law here are very very different things, and a lot of times people kind of eh whatever because they pass some law, let them try to enforce it. Yeah. <laughs> like that's kind of the attitude sometimes amongst people, which also uh, <laughs> makes me feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, um, another article uh, that, that's kind of interesting given uh, this backdrop on taxes. It was uh, came out on CNBC October 15th, and it's titled, Ecuador's Rafael Correa Pushes for Foreign Investment. This is, I'm looking over there, was that CNBC? Yeah, NBC, CNBC, CNBC yeah. that came out, and it was an interview that... Um, that one of the news anchors, uh, her name escapes me, did uh, with the president. It, it uh, that was Michelle Carusa Cabrera, yeah. if I recognize her face from yes. back back when I used to watch that nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it reads like an an Onion article. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it really does. The 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 uh, the headline, but um, and I won't go into detail about this article. I think the what I'd like to tie it back to is something you were mentioning earlier, Jesse, about. Um, talking about the prices for things here and the prices for property and if you have a source of income. I think right now is one of the best times to be an entrepreneur in Ecuador um, because there's just so much opportunity. And that's really driven primarily, in my mind, by the drop in oil prices. So you have a country that produces, or or not produces, but 52% roughly of their exports are oil. So the rest is bananas, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much <laughs> bananas and chocolate and coffee or cacao, excuse me, uh, shrimp. Good business, by the way. Uh, tuna as well, too. Mm-hmm. I learned re- very recently. No, I was joking about bananas, but they do export a very large percentage of the world's bananas. Yeah, they're the largest. They're the l- world's largest exporter. They're responsible for just under 30 percent of the world's world exports of, of bananas. But they don't taste good when you buy them in the States. They taste really good here. <laughs> <laughs> and they have all these different varieties that they don't export that are, you know, some of my favorites. There's like three or four different kinds of bananas that I've had here that are all delicious. Oh, easily. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, what that's done is create a situation where you know, there's been some negative things about that where now they're sort of looking for tax revenue wherever they can find it. Actually, um, a guy who works in our office was recently um, hit with a parking bill, um, you know, that normally, you know, is like three or four bucks. He ended up having to pay $20 for it. Um, so a ticket. Yeah, a yeah, ticket. A so parking. they're getting a lot more aggressive with that, especially at the municipality level where they're trying to just, you know, find revenue wherever they can. Um, But the good side about that is that you're seeing a lot of tax breaks and incentives for people who want to start businesses related to exporting and local production of goods here. And I think there's a real opportunity for finished goods and things like superfoods, which we talked about. I mean, you have just a great climate here in Ecuador for growing just about anything that you can imagine. So you can have businesses where import input costs are really low. Granted, um, some of the regulatory costs are high in comparison to um, to what you can get for these things. So it's just a matter of really creating a market in a lot of ways for a lot of things, either by exporting them to places where there already is a market or really creating a niche market here. And I think a perfect example of that is, you know, craft brewing. Uh, we had um, Greg Gideon on on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, 
And you know, craft brewing is a is a trend that's growing all over the world and growing very fast in places like the states. And there's plenty of craft brewers here, but because there's so few, there's really an opportunity to if you can do it better than other people, then you know you can create a really viable business. And I think that's what Greg's doing. And I think there's lots of other businesses that could be done in just that way, following that exact same model. And something driving that that's an impetus of that of that is the fact that you know government revenues here are lower and so those incentives are are, um, are being put out there for for people to to um to create businesses that will be successful now that's a great point I mean, there's there's kind of two categories of business that i would be really interested in if i was an entrepreneur coming to ecuador one is uh export um because of some of the some of the points you made. I mean, your input costs are very low. Your raw materials are very cheap, very abundant. Uh, labor, very cheap. Um, all also, those energy, water, those kinds of things too, very cheap. And you, you know, if you're if you're growing stuff, you have a great story too, because it's just some you know the most mineralized soil in the world, the most you know the most greatest water, air. You, know, you can talk about all those things that Ecuador has that uh, you know I would add to your story. So yeah, export. Export business would be a great business of many different kinds, uh, whether it's raw materials or finished goods. The other, the other, you know, businesses that I think um, make a lot of sense are businesses, and we've talked about this before, but businesses that cater to the growing expat community uh, in the in various parts of Ecuador where that's happening, um, because you know you're you've just got all, obviously all the trends in your favor. So if you're servicing, I mean, for example, here in Loja, there's a lot of things I wish we had that we don't. Um, and it's not because, you know, the, the reason they're not here is just because nobody's come here yet, thought of it and done it. Right. Um, and these are not things that are, these are not things that you need to be a rocket science to think of. No. They're just things that we like, have back home that people could use here and would want here, but that nobody has taken the initiative to do. I mean, like a decent sandwich shop. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, you know, and obviously like, hey, that might not be what you're coming to Ecuador to, you know, that's not a business maybe you're coming to get into. But I mean, there, there's maybe one, two tops places in Ecuador you can get like an OK sandwich, but there's no like U.S. style sandwich place. You know, hey, give me ham and Swiss and lettuce, tomatoes, and mayonnaise. You, know, this, you don't, don't, they just don't do that. Um, and there's a couple of decent pizza places here, but I mean, decent is kind of. I would call them decent because I've adjusted and lowered my standards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about that place that you went to in Salinas on on vacation yeah, a, a couple months back. Right, and that's you know there you've got an international community, and, and that's what that guy's catering to. So there's a guy who Italian guy from Italy who opened in a pizza shop in Salinas. It's I mean I come from New York. I know I, I was in New York for many years, uh, kind of a pizza snob. You know, had my like kind of <laughs> had my like few places in New York that I would go for pizza, wouldn't eat it anywhere else. Well, New Haven, Connecticut actually also has some some very good pizza. But um, you know, this guy has pizza in Salinas that is, you know, would 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 make my top five in New York. So really, really good pizza there. But yeah, I mean I miss it tremendously being here in Loja. Um but yeah, so you know, the 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 thing about the downside is the business environment as far as the government. The upside is the fundamentals that you have on the ground as far as the opportunity um, and, and the costs if you're exporting. So, you know, that's kind of how I would frame it. But yeah, I think at this point in time, the, the benefit outweighs the cost uh, tremendously. And I don't see that. I see that getting better in the future because I don't see uh, the sort of socialist ideology being able to be advanced anymore. And, and that's absent that things will improve uh, in terms of the business climate. Yeah, well said. Um, Any articles you had that uh, crossed the desk that want to chat about a little bit? Yeah, a couple couple articles. That gold I, article that you mentioned was pretty interesting. Interesting chat, chat to, you know, interesting stat, not chat, to share with people given some of the conversations we've had recently about gold and silver as currency. Yeah, so I mean, if you followed us, you know that we we like gold and silver uh, as an investment standpoint for many reasons, which we're not going to get into again here. You can read a blog on it on the po on the website. You can go back to our previous episodes and hear the reasons why we like gold and silver. But I know we were making the point in a previous show um, that the amount of paper gold that exists in the world is significantly higher than the amount of physical gold so in other words you know you, there's some amount of gold in a vault and then that gold is sold out in paper contracts many times over 
Well, I came across an article by Zero Hedge that uh, came out on the 4th of November. He puts out this stat. This means that as of today, the gold, quote, coverage ratio or the amount of paper claims for every ounce of physical has just hit a new all-time high of 293 ounces of paper per ounce of registered physical. So, you know, to, to put that in perspective, if you understand market dynamics, even, even in, a, in a basic way, if you've got something that people want and they're buying it, but they're just buying a representative, a representation of it, and they can't actually take ownership of the thing they're trying to buy. At some point in time, that has to revert to its true supply and demand, which means the amount of gold people can actually take um, ownership of, or delivery of in this case in terms of contracts. And that number right now, according to this article, is 293 to 1 in terms of the amount of paper gold ownership versus physical gold that exists to be owned, uh, at least on, on the exchange. So you've got a situation that at some point has to play out from a, from a supply-demand perspective where people are trying to take ownership of their gold, can't, that puts physical gold at a premium and you'll see the price skyrocket to what it should be now if it weren't manipulated in all of the ways we've talked about before right yeah i think that really you know puts um i think that really highlights in 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 a in concrete form why we like gold and silver for sure speaking of uh currencies in the dollar and those kinds of things. We've talked about this. I, this article is a little bit old. It's actually a few months old. It's from uh, Simon Black, who's somebody that we, we enjoy reading. It's, uh, I think it's really worth reading in its entirety. It's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll run through it. But it, it, he does a really nice job of articulating uh, where the dollar stands and just why you don't want to be holding dollars. And he doesn't get into all of the reasons. There's several more. But he does a very nice job of articulating it. So the United States, the, 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 excuse me, the title of the article is It's Happening, More U.S. Allies Join the Anti-Dollar Alliance. The United States government just went from, please baby, don't leave me, to frustrated threats and whining. After the U.K. announced it will join the new China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, as a founding member late last week, Germany, France, and Italy decided yesterday to follow Britain's lead and join as well. Welcome to the beginning of the end of the U.S. dollar's domination. It's happening. For the past few decades, America was the undisputed global economic and political superpower. The entire world happily used the U.S. dollar and hence the U.S. banking system. More importantly, the world happily placed its trust in the U.S. government. But there's a limit to how irresponsible, reckless, and threatening you can be. Eventually, such behavior catches up with you. That time has now come. The U.S. government is now drowning in debt that can never be repaid. The U.S. government's own numbers, in fact, estimate its level of insolvency at roughly $60 trillion. This means that when you add up all the assets of the United States, every acre of land, every tank, every drone, every drop of oil in the strategic reserve, and subtract all the debt and liabilities, the result is minus $60 trillion. That is the net worth of the United States government. On top of that, the U.S. government has chosen to use its once-trusted currency and banking system as weapons to blackmail the rest of the world. FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, is probably the best recent example. FATCA's provisions require every single bank in the world to jump into bed with the Internal Revenue Service and agree to all sorts of expensive, debilitating information sharing agreements. And any bank which dares to defy the U.S. government gets effectively blackballed from the U.S. banking system and subject to a 30% withholding tax. On top of that, the U.S. government has taken to slamming foreign banks with the most astonishing fines. $9 billion, for example, in the case of French bank PN, PN, BNP Paribas. Paraba. Pat whatever. That yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember when that happened. <laughs> BNP's wrongdoing was conducting business with countries like Cuba and Iran that the U.S. government doesn't like. Bear in mind, PNP is a French bank and broke no French law whatsoever. Moreover, the business was done through its Swiss subsidiary and they broke no Swiss, Swiss, Swiss law either. That didn't make 
That didn't matter to Uncle Sam, which fined the bank $9 billion under threat of being kicked out of the U.S. banking system. Blackmail, extortion, intimidation. This isn't the behavior of a trusted friend, and it's the behavior of an arrogant psychopath, and the rest of the world is sick of it. Yeah. Other countries... Yeah, go ahead. yeah I, I, who... Arrogant psychopath with guns. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, right. The aforementioned drone. <laughs> Other countries, even allied nations, see that times are changing. There are new players on the rise, and the U.S. isn't the only option anymore. Increasingly, they're turning to China, who by some metrics is already the largest economy in the world. And the U.S. government can't do anything about it. This is happening now with increasing speed. It's mainstream news everywhere. The U.S. is being shunned by its allies for the new kid on the block. This has major implications for the United States. History shows that when reserve currencies change, the losing country almost invariably goes through significant turmoil. Yes. <laughs> but, here's, but here's the thing. The world is changing, but it's not coming to an end. Yes, things will change dramatically in the West in the coming years. The standard of living, another key point here, the standard of living that was attainable in the U.S. because of its economic dominance will diminish. For cues, look to Europe to see how unsustainable policies are unravel when you don't have the backing of the world's reserve currency. Just nails it. But people who recognize and embrace these changes early will prosper, for there will be tremendous opportunities throughout this process. Um, and he goes on to talk about, you know, moving your savings into other places and, and you know, different different ways you can go about about protecting yourself from that. But um, I think he I think he does a nice job of summing up where we're at in terms of the U.S. dollar and its its global dominance and the effects that that'll have, um, certainly on the U.S., but other places as well. Right. Yeah, because they're just there. I mean, the financial system of the U.S. just, there's not a place that it doesn't reach at this point in time. Yeah. Um, another article, uh, also by Simon Black, which I don't want to read i don't want to bore you with it although it may be more interesting than you and i i don't know <laughs> but i don't want to i don't i'm not going to read the whole thing but um it's really an article uh that revolves around bitcoin which i am not a believer in but but i think i understand why people like it and yeah. i support it's the idea behind it yeah someone actually asked me about that the other day uh when they were asking just general questions when people come into town they and they're thinking about relocating here Invariably, the three things that come up is health care, child care, or education if they have kids, or in the banking system. And so he was saying, well, if you, you know, I was speaking to another expat or I had read some that you shouldn't have more than $32,000 in any bank. And he was asking if I recommended if he split it or, you know, split his assets around different banks. And, you know, I replied to him, well, you know, I don't really trust any bank. So I don't I don't I wouldn't say that, you know, Ecuador is excluded from that in any way. Sure. I mean, thirty two thousand dollars is the threshold um, for banking insurance like it is in the like one hundred thousand dollars is in the United States with FDIC FDIC insurance. Um, but I was saying that, you know, I think gold and silver is just a better way to, you know, store wealth. If you need to make, you know, have transactions, obviously you need to be liquid. And for that, you should have, you know, liquid currency. And, you know, banks are good for those kinds of things because they've really made it so that you can't really do a lot of those transactions without banks, especially if you're talking about cross country transactions. Um, so yeah, we were chatting about that a little bit and he asked me, well, you know, what did I think about Bitcoin? And I was like, I don't think about it, but, um, you know, certainly it's something that's on people's minds. It's something that gets a lot of press and, and certainly I support the idea of thinking about alternative ways to be able to, you know, make transactions with other people. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's appeal is tremendous in terms of, Hey, you know, here's this untrackable, untraceable currency, not subject to the inflation of, you know, the, the central banks around the world. Uh, I can do transactions potentially anonymously. I can move my money very easily. Um, you know, hey, I, all I thought only terrorists did that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. Well, Jesse, that. you're a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to the U.S. definition, the U.S. government's definition, I would say definitely <laughs> you, you and I are terrorists and most other people as well. But, um but yeah, so I mean, the idea behind Bitcoin is is wonderful, something I very much support. I just, uh, and I don't want to get into this too much, but I just think the dynamics of Bitcoin in particular um, have some have some flaws. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so without, with, uh, I'll try, I'll try not to just read here too, too much, but getting into this article, which is titled, have you heard of this digital currency? That's a total scam. And this is again from Simon Black, uh, just, just a few days ago. Um, as, and this is about you know, partway through the article. As Jim Rickards reminded me some time, reminded me some time ago, most currencies are digital, even the U.S. dollar. The Federal Reserve's estimate of U.S. dollar money supply is 12.1 trillion. Yet only about 10 percent of that is physical cash in circulation. The rest, more than 10 trillion, is simply a series of entries in banks' core system databases. In other words, the money in your savings account isn't piled up inside your bank's vault. Far from it. Your savings doesn't really exist. It's all just digits in an electronic account ledger. And I just, you know, that needs to sink in for people if they haven't come across this uh, understanding previously. You know, banks create money digitally through the value of your signature when you when you uh, sign up for a loan, they don't have the money in the back. They're not, they're not like, it's not like you walk into a bank and you're, you, you know, hey, I'm going to buy this car, so I go for a car loan, and they've got this stack of money that's sitting in the back, and they bring it out to you. The money does not exist prior to when you signed the uh, loan agreement, and they created it on their computer. So that's true of money, and of course, money, the money supply is always increasing, devaluing the you know, remaining mo the money already in circulation. So that's where your what your savings is in. If if you don't understand that um, picture, and if you if you don't, I encourage you to do some research on it because I think it'll change the way you look at uh, investing in economics. Um, so he goes on to talk about the digital currencies. You know, the way that this concept started or this you know, this um, system started. He says, this concept actually dates back to the Middle Ages when Italian bankers realized that they can, could conduct their transactions without physical money. Rather than risk transporting gold coins across the countryside, medieval bankers merely an an annotate, annotated <laughs> their ledgers with debit and credit entries. They didn't, have the num they didn't have the computers, but it was the same concept. They kept track of transactions and balances on account ledgers instead of with physical money. In the late 1960s, the IMF took this idea to the next level when they created their own digital currency for the exclusive use of governments and central banks. And Darnell, you were talking a little bit about this last week with special drawing rights, SDRs. Right. Um, and even though the IMF's balance sheet totals nearly $300 billion SDR, <laughs> around $211 billion US dollars, not a single SDR exists in physical form. 100% uh, of the... Oh, so I can't go to the bank and go pick up an SDR? <laughs> no, I, no, you cannot. 100%, uh, but, but they're at interest. 100% uh, of the SDR money supply is digital, just like Bitcoin. It exists in computer databases, making it the digital equivalent of a 500-year-old accounting system. There's one key difference, though. Yeah, well, and this is where he, he gets into the liking Bitcoin. But, um, but you know, he talks about how the SDR is, a, in particular, is a total scam. Uh, the entire reason it was created is because the system didn't have enough real savings. So they, quote, solved the problem by creating a new digital currency that allowed them to easily conjure more money out of thin air, which is the way our monetary system works. That's just another example of it. Um so anyhow, some interesting, interesting thoughts there. Yeah. You know, something that's interesting on a micro level that ties into that is how governments treat your savings that they, that they, I guess, somewhat voluntarily, but voluntarily mandate you to do, <laughs> I think might be a good Politician way to explain it. Politician <laughs> With, uh, you know, social security, Right. Um, I read a very interesting article from a uh, magazine I like quite a bit called Lat Am Investor out of uh, the UK. It's their only investment journal that's focused specifically on Latin America. And uh, there was an article there talking about how the uh, foreign minister, or excuse me, the financial minister of Peru had recently stepped down. And part of the reason he stepped down was some backlash about uh, a proposal that he had backed to um, quote-unquote increase the um, participation in the formal economy by implementing a law forcing independent contractors to pay into their equivalent of Social Security. So I just want to have people who are listen listening in think about that for a minute. 
So what is Social Security? So presumably Social Security is the government in any country, not here, not not specifically in Peru, just um, thinking about this just in general. So the government says, well, we want to help you save for your retirement. So we're going to take money from your account or, you know, take money from your paycheck or however you earn money. You're, you know, if you own a business, we're going to make you contribute some of the money that you make now to this fund that you have no access to that we're going to tax you on and use in any way that we see fit. Um, you know, I mean, look at Social Security now. I mean, I wish I had printed out this article, another article from Simon Black um, that talked about this. He's not the only person that's talked about this. A lot of lots of people Everyone, have. Yeah. Um, but Social Security now in the United States is essentially insolvent. So they well, make it is insolvent. Yeah, so they make a promise that they can't keep. Then they say, then you know, one side of the aisle says, you know, well. We have to preserve this at all costs. This is a pr promise that we're making to seniors. And then another side of the aisle says, well, we just can't do it. So we, you know, we have to, so basically younger generations who were not promised this are going to have to pay more and work longer to support a system that is not only insolvent, but just unsustainable. The math just doesn't make sense. Um, so people won't stop to think, well, maybe this isn't a good idea, or maybe people can do this better on their own. They say, no, we need more control. We need more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? More, um, not entrapment, it's like uh, uh, coercion. We need more coercion to help you do something that really we're not trying to help you do. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bill of goods. I mean, it's just another, it's just another tax. Right. Like, okay, we're going to implement this tax. We're not going to call it a tax. We're going to say it's for you, but then we're going to use all the money for other stuff and say we're broke. I right. mean, you know, oh, sorry, we don't have any of the money. We used it for other stuff. So right. you mean it was just a tax? <laughs> <laughs> like, right. you know. Yeah, so now you have to, we're going to take this money from you, but now you have to work until you're 75 to get it. But what about all those people that don't live to be 75? <laughs> where does that? Where does their money go? Where does their money go? So just just interesting. And, you know, I was actually happy to read that, you know, that was one of the reasons why the guy lost his job is people saw through it and said, well, if I'm an independent contractor and doing business, why should I be contributing to something that I don't want to contribute to or that I'm not going to get? If if people do want to participate in a program like that, it should be voluntary, it should be voluntary. And there should be some accountability about how that money gets spent. Because if we took government out of it, and this was a private agreement between, you know, say myself and Jesse, for example, um, I wouldn't just, he, you know, if he were, sa if I were giving him my money to save and I said, well, you know, what did you do with it? <laughs> I, I, I would expect an answer other than, you know, uh, you know. I did whatever I wanted with it, and it was for your best interest. And you know, try to take you know, if you take it from me, I'll shoot you in the head. Yeah, I mean, going back to something you said before, what was it? it was like, oh yeah, he wanted more people to participate in the formal economy. I mean, so the government wants to play middleman, you know, amongst every transaction. They want a cut of every transaction. You know, I go to the store, I buy something, the government wants a cut. I go to you know, any anything I do, the government would like a cut. That's what he means by formal economy. Like I would like more cuts of more transactions because some people right now are transaction transacting without giving me a cut. Right. In other words, that that's not formal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if it's informal if I don't get paid. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I'm me just myself, so everyone else in the world who's doing an in doing a transaction that doesn't involve me, which I promise you that there's a lot of them, <laughs> that if they're doing that and I'm the government, well then, you know, that's not formal. You know, and you, I need to recognize that that's formal. So for me to recognize that, you know, all you have to do is pay me. Just pay me. <laughs> right. So. Well, we are running out of time. We had a bunch of other topics, but we'll hit them next week. Um, anything, any closing thoughts? Um, closing thoughts. Hmm. There was something. No, you know what? Yeah, I think we can leave it there. It's Friday. Call it a day. Um, 
yeah, I think that's good. What about you? No, no. Send them, send them home. Okay, good. Well, again, we thank you guys for tuning in to the seventh Abundant Living Ecuador podcast. I'm looking forward to the point where we lose track of how many podcasts we've done. And don't say that every time. So again, thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. And we'll talk to you next week. Take care.